What's up, YouTube? Ryan here. Welcome back to 1517 Films, where in every episode I'm always contending for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. And on this Thursday in the fifth and final week of Lent, we're continuing through the passion narrative from the end of the Gospel of Mark. We've got a really good quote about whether or not the crucifixion is law or gospel. And of course, uh, of course our Lenten catechesis, this time with confession and absolution. Stick around. <music> So Pilate has had Jesus scourged and handed over to be crucified. And now we continue on through this passion narrative, which, if we're honest, we we know rather well as Christians, but uh, I think we should slow down, which is tough to do in the Gospel of Mark, but we're taking this as slow as we can to really meditate on it and get as much out of it as possible. So we're continuing on uh, in Mark chapter 15, beginning at verse 16. And the soldiers led him away inside the palace, that is, the governor's headquarters. And they called together the whole battalion. And they clothed him in a purple cloak and twisted together a crown of thorns. They put it on him, and they began to salute him. Hail, King of the Jews! And they were striking his head with a reed and spitting on him and kneeling down in homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of his purple cloak and put his own clothes on him, and they led him out to crucify him. And they compelled the passer-by, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. And they brought him to the place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him, and divided his garments among them, casting lots for them to decide what each should take. And it was the third hour when they crucified him. And the inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. And with him they crucified two robbers, one on his right and one on his left. And those who passed by decried him, wagging their heads and saying, Ah, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes mocked him to one another, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down from the cross that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also reviled him. And they crucified him. This is kind of how they say it in all of the Gospels. And they crucified him. And it took very graphic movie for us in modern times 2,000 years removed from crucifixion to understand what that meant and, and what that looked like and but if you'll notice the gospel here is not necessarily picking up on the suffering it, it was assumed that the reader would know the suffering of crucifixion here we pick up on the shame so if you watch, and I suggest you look him up on YouTube, Pastor Brian Wolfmuller does some really great work on the threefold suffering of Christ, the the pain, the shame, and the wrath. And uh, it, it, we see the wrath of God fully in the uh, words of Jesus from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But the shame, the shame which Jesus endured, uh, the, the mocking, the beating, the being clothed, uh, in purple, the, the royal color, the hard-to-come-by color that only true kings wore, the sign above his head, a, a token of Christian of uh, crucifixion that your charge would be placed above your head so that all could see and be discouraged from such behavior. The fulfilling of prophecy, the, the gambling for his clothes, the refusal of the, the wine mixed with myrrh to dull the pain. Jesus is going to endure all of it. He is going to endure all of the shame. He is going to endure all of the pain. And he endures all of the wrath of God. And in this, we can see that no human in human history has ever suffered like Christ. Sure, we may suffer shame. And sure, obviously, there were two thieves crucified next to him who suffered the pain, the same pain, 
but the wrath of God, the abandonment of the Father, the hopelessness of being outside of God's presence and still in perfect faith crying out Psalm 22, and as Pastor Brian Wolf Mueller would point out, so that we can pray Psalm 23. But we come to a question now. Uh, it, it's no secret that I'm a Lutheran, and I believe that the Bible is divided into two doctrines, that of the law and of the gospel. So what is this crucifixion narrative? Well, we have uh, a writing from the epitome of the formula of Concord to address this. Concerning the revelation of sin, Moses' veil hangs, 2 Corinthians 3, 12 through 16, before the eyes of all people, as long as they hear the bare preaching of the law and nothing about Christ. Therefore, they do not learn from the law to see their sin correctly. They either become bold hypocrites who swell with the opinions of their own righteousness like the Pharisees, Matthew 23, or they despair like Judas, Matthew 27, 3 through 5. Therefore, Christ takes the law into his own hands and explains it spiritually, Matthew 5, 21 through 48, Romans 7, 14. In this way, God's wrath is revealed from heaven against all sinners, Romans 1, 18, so that they see how great it is. In this way, they are directed back to the law, and then they first learn from it to know their sin correctly, a knowledge that Moses never could have forced out of them. According to this, the preaching of the suffering and death of Christ, the Son of God, is a serious and terrifying proclamation and declaration of God's wrath. By such preaching, people are first led into the law correctly, after Moses' veil has been removed from them. Then they understand correctly, for the first time, what great things God requires of us in his law, none of which we can keep. Therefore, they know we are to seek all our righteousness in Christ. As long as all this, namely Christ's suffering and death, proclaims God ra God's wrath and terrifies a person, it is still not properly the preaching of the gospel. It remains the preaching of Moses and the law, and it is, therefore, an alien work of Christ passing through his teachings. Christ arrives at his proper office, that is, to preach grace, console, and give life, which is properly the preaching of the gospel. Is the crucifixion narrative law or gospel? Yes. Uh, if we color all the law verses in blue and all the gospel verses in red, then what we see here is a violet so beautiful as to, to match the, the violet robe that Christ was, was robed in, in his, in his shame and humiliation. It, the, the preaching of Christ and the way we should meditate on it is law and gospel at the same time this is this is not god demonstrate god i asked god how much he loved me and he said this much and stretched out his arms and died this is there's so much happening the the blood sacrifice the the propitiation the the paschal passover lamb whose blood is is put over the lintel and posts of the doors of our hearts so that death will pass over us. The, the, the crucifixion of Jesus is law and gospel. It is God's wrath towards you and me, but poured out onto Christ. Now, for our Lenten catechesis, uh, we, we, we go on to uh, confession and absolution, something that many mainland Protestants just don't do anymore. From the Augsburg Confession, our churches teach that private absolution should be retained in the churches, although listing all sins is not necessary for confession, for according to the psalm, it is impossible. Who can discern his error? Psalm 19.12. Our churches teach that there is forgiveness of sins for those who have fallen after baptism whenever they are converted. The church ought to impart absolution to those who return to repentance, Jeremiah 3.12. Now, strictly speaking, repentance consists of two parts. One part is contrition, that is, terror striking the conscience through the knowledge of sin. The other part is faith, which is born of the gospel, Romans 10.17, or the absolution, and believes that, for Christ's sake, sins are forgiven. 
It comforts the conscience and delivers it from terror. Then good works are bound to follow, which are the fruit of repentance. Galatians 5, 22-23 Confession in the churches is not abolished among us. The people are very carefully taught about faith in the absolution before there was profound silence about faith. Our people are taught that they should highly prize the absolution as being God's voice and pronounced by God's command. The power of the keys, Matthew sixteen nineteen, is set forth in its beauty. They are reminded what great consolation it brings to anxious consciences and that God requires faith to believe such absolution as a voice sounding from heaven. Example, John twelve twenty eight through 30. They are taught that such faith in Christ truly obtains and receives the forgiveness of sins. Our churches teach that naming every sin is not necessary and that consciences should not be burdened with worry about naming every sin. It is impossible to recount all sin. If only sins that can be named are forgiven, consciences could never find peace. For many sins cannot be seen or remembered. The ancient writers also testify that a listing of sins is not necessary. Because of the great benefit of absolution and because it is otherwise useful to the conscience, confession is retained among us. Oftentimes, Protestants will say, and I've heard this from my own family, which is Protestant, that Luther didn't go far enough. That's why we needed more denominations to finish what Luther started. Luther didn't go far enough because he wasn't going forward at all. He wasn't blazing a new trail. He was pointing back. The ancient church, before the crud and crumble of the Roman Catholic Church of the 16th century, and saying, this is historic biblical Christianity, and I want to go back to that. So, for the reasons listed, Lutherans, we retain confession and absolution. Uh, we pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you sent your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, to take upon himself our flesh and to suffer death upon the cross. Mercifully grant that we may follow the example of his great humility and patience and be made partakers of his resurrection through the same Jesus Christ our Lord who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Until next time, may God richly bless you and the grace and mercy won for you by Jesus' vicarious death on the cross for all of your sins.